John is a Gilman alum, graduated in class of 85. He's also a, a Duke University alum, graduated there in 1989. He attended and graduated from the University of Baltimore Law School in 1993, uh, which is about the time his uh, family has got involved with the Orioles. And today, John is going to speak a little bit about his uh, experience with the Orioles over the last 20 years, which yeah, just hearing the word Baltimore Orioles has got to make you feel warm with this pending snowstorm coming. I'm sure you all, like me, are a little tired of the winter that we're experiencing. So hopefully his conversation today will lead us to the warm spring that awaits us. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker today, John Angelos. Good afternoon, everybody. I uh, want to start off by saying I uh, feel all the weight of the world has come off me because Willie refrained from telling any injurious Gilman stories in his introduction. So I, I, I do feel good about that. Um, I'm very honored to be here. I was honored when, when Mr. Franklin called me and um, invited me to come out. And uh, Willie said something earlier today when we were sitting, uh, we were sitting at the table. Uh, uh, with respect to Mr. Finney, that M Mr. Finney is somebody you never said no to. And, and I think when I think about two, two people in my life, especially when I was a young man, to whom you would never say no, they were uh, the, Mr. Finney and Mr. Franklin are two of those people. And, um, uh, and I'll tell you why. Um, uh, I, you know, long before I had the good fortune to become involved with the Orioles, an involvement I've had for the past 20 years, uh, as a result of uh, our ownership group, my, uh, the, the ownership group my, my dad put together 20-some years ago, um, I, had the, I had the very great fortune to be involved in the Gilman community. And as a 12-year uh, man at Gilman, I had uh, the honor to have Mr. Finney as my headmaster. And I couldn't be happier to have him here today mm -hmm. as we're talking about the Orioles and, and all these things. He really set the standard by which um, every time I walk into a school, whether it's a public school, a prep school, or whatever it is, I think I'm looking at that school through certain eyes, and I think the eyes I'm using are, are, are Mr. Finney's as I look at it to see how those students are acting, uh, how the teachers are functioning, how the headmaster's engaged, and, um, and uh, I, I really can't say enough about the, uh, the example he made, gave me when I was a student, and I view that uh, as an adult uh, with even greater appreciation, so I'm really happy to have him here. I also would say that about Mr. Franklin something similar in a different respect, um, and I wish he were here uh, today, but I, I had planned to say it about him as well. Um, Mr. Franklin, as a parent and as a supporter, was really in a, in a, in a class of his own uh, in much the same way as Mr. Finney as headmaster of our school. Mr. Franklin, um, at, at a different time, today you, you read a lot about parents who are heavily involved in their students, uh, their, their children's lives as athletes and so forth. Mr. Franklin was doing that three and four decades ago. He was an incredible booster for, for our school and for our wrestling program. And I think when, when Willie, when our team won the uh, co-championship in the MSAs, yeah, that was in no small part due to, to his support. And uh, the great thing about Mr. Franklin's enthusiasm was and is that he wasn't just there for his kids, um, many of whom were great wrestlers for Gilman, and he wasn't there just for the, the best kids, the MSA champs, the national prep champs. He was there for all the kids, and he was there for the kid that was on the JV toiling away for three years and suddenly was pressed into action. Mr. Finney, uh, excuse me, Mr. Franklin rooted for that, for that boy just as hard as he did for the best. And, and he, again, uh, uh, set a great example for us as, as young men and as adults, and I couldn't have been happier to get the call from him. Um, Mr. Franklin, in addition to inviting me to come speak, share some time with you all today, um, gave me the title for the speech, which I much appreciated. He, he, he entitled the speech, The Orioles, A Labor of Love, and I, I thought that was uh, a particularly uh, a good choice. Um, I, would, I would say to you that um, uh, our ownership group, and I, I've been involved with the team from virtually the beginning. I started out working in various capacities for the Orioles, uh, ticketing sales and whatnot, and as time went on, became more involved in um, the day-to-day -day business operations of the club. Um, and as we developed a television network, the Mid-Atlantic Sports Network spent more time with that. 
Um, but I think the Orioles and any locally owned uh, sports franchise, the Ravens, the Orioles, franchises around the country um, are labors of love. Um, certainly there are business issues and hard and fast financial decisions that, that the owner has to make. And, and whether it's my father or the many other owners around the world of sports, those are inevitable, whether it's to sign a player or uh, a rebuild, um, what kind of TV contract enter into and whatnot. Those are, those are much like, if not entirely like, the decisions you all make in your businesses every day. But there's another aspect to professional sports, and that is the platform it creates and provides to uh, the community and to the ownership group that's involved and invested in that, just as the community is, to do good works. And I think, when I think about what our emphases have been over the last uh, 20 years plus, I think our first emphasis, uh, my dad's first emphasis was to put together a local group of Baltimore area people. And uh, uh, some of those people are, are better known than others, obviously. Uh, uh, the late Tom Clancy and his wife, uh, Wanda, uh, Barry Levinson, Pam Shriver, uh, the, uh, Jim McKay, and uh, late Jim McKay and his family, and many other prominent area people were part of that group and are part of that group today. So restoring the team to local ownership was incredibly important to us as a prime directive. Um, the next thing that we stressed and have stressed was making the club stable and uh, a strong asset then, now, and in the future so that the club could never be relocated from Baltimore to another market. Um, there was a strong history of local ownership in Baltimore of sports franchises and of the Orioles in particular. Uh, Mr. Hoffberger owned the team for many years and, in fact, under his leadership enjoyed its greatest amount of success. So there was a lot to be said for the Hoffberger family and local ownership in general. Um, it, in fact, it, it was really only a brief period, relatively speaking, where when Mr. Williams and Mr. Jacobs on the team that you didn't have lo local ownership here. So I think it was important uh, to achieve that. Um, beyond that, it was important to our ownership group to make sure that the team was and remains um, permanently in the area, permanently a franchise in Baltimore with strong media territories and strong franchise revenues and an ever-growing asset value so that there will always be a team here not impacted by relocation or contraction or any of the things that sometimes befall leagues. And we, and we think we've achieved that over time and the club will always be here. And, and our goal is that whether our group owns a team or, or not, that the team is always locally owned and is always in Baltimore well into the future. And we think it, it will be. Um, beyond that, the next goal of our ownership has been to take the Orioles as a platform in its events, in its television, radio, and digital activities, and ensure that it is engaged with the community. So um, uh, I, I am often not the one that will uh, pat ourselves on the back and say that all the things we've done in the community, but we do try to be active. Uh, the Ravens are very active. The Orioles are very active. That's what local sports franchises should do. They should be out helping the local charitable, nonprofit, and civic entities to raise money for the community, continue to try and uh, assist in fundraising. Uh, we just had a, a nice association with the American Heart Association and the, and the annual Heart Ball, and, and we couldn't have been more pleased to participate in all the good work they do. Um, we, we are involved with over 800 charitable groups a year, and that's incredibly important to our family and our ownership, all of our ownership group members to be engaged in the charitable nonprofit activities of the area. Uh, beyond that, um, one of the things you've seen is over the recent past, first with uh, Andy McPhail, Andy and, and, and his dad, Lee McPhail, had a tremendous Baltimore area connection uh, and a baseball connection, bringing Andy to the Orioles and then bringing Buck Showalter and then Dan Duquette. That, that line, that evolution from the McPhails and the Showalters and the Duquettes to build the Orioles to be a team that relies on scouting and player development, building from within, um, not, a, not a team that relies on free agency, except here and there where it's appropriate, building conservatively and prudently in the old model of the Oriole way that the Hofbergers made so successful, that the McPhails made so successful. That's been a 
an emphasis of, of this ownership group as well. Beyond, beyond that, our, our emphasis into the future is to keep the team strong and to continue to evolve the sport of baseball so that the game is better uh, tomorrow than it was yesterday, better in the future than it was 20 years ago when we bought the club. Um, we, we see baseball as continuing to grow and continuing to become more competitively balanced. The NFL has a wonderfully elegant way of balancing small and mid-market teams. Baseball's not there yet. We expect baseball will head in that direction, and when it does, when you get more competitively balanced payrolls so that big, big market clubs can't use their payroll power to dominate smaller clubs, which you see in the NFL today, where teams like the Steelers and the Chiefs and the uh, Ravens are able to compete with the New York teams and compete every year. It's based on merit. Our hope is that baseball will head further in that direction. When that happens, smaller and mid-market teams will win even more of their share, and that'll be a boon for the economic activities, economic tourism and incubation for markets like Baltimore. So um, our emphasis has been on all of those things. Um, in addition, we've, we've tried to take the club to a few places outside of the regional and local area. Um, as you may recall, we made an emphasis of taking the club to Cuba in 1999, uh, bringing the Cuban national team here for historic people-to-people -people series. We worked with the Clinton administration and others, worked with Johns Hopkins University that has a vibrant uh, Latin American studies group and created that opportunity. We uh, used the Orioles' uh, uh, access to Major League Baseball to uh, advise the International Olympic Committee and the Athens Olympics. Uh, we've stressed things like economic impact. We've just completed, a, in the last few years, a brand new training facility in Sarasota where the Orioles will be able to um, train in the midst of all the other American League East clubs who have spring training there and other clubs. And where Orioles fans will be able to come to Florida to a great market in Sarasota, a strong, vibrant place. And we think uh, with all those things, the club is well positioned into the future. Um, I, I often, when I talk to people about um, the Orioles, um, prefer questions and um, I'm, I, I, instead of my talking with you all or talking in your direction, I, I would welcome any questions and, and to have an, a give and take. One of the great things about baseball is that um, everybody likes to have their say and everybody loves the game and is passionate about the history and the statistical database and uh, who is the greatest uh, home run hitter and all the rest of that. So um, uh, I, I can tell you that um, the, the Orioles uh, continue to evolve and we've certainly had some good seasons the last couple. Buck and Dan are continuing to try and make us competitive into the future um, and we have all the faith in the world that they will do that. Um, I spend most of my time on the business issues, very little on the on the field activities um, and most of that time on the media and digital and television rights of mass and, and those things. But uh, having spent 20 years with this, it has been, as Mr. Franklin said, a, a labor of love and, and uh, we're very bullish on where the team's gonna be and in the future. Um, uh, our ability to hopefully retain players and keep competing with the big markets and, and hopefully bring a championship back sometime in the future. But the real goal is to remain relevant, competitive, and in contention, um, and to do as well as we can on behalf of the community. So uh, I would welcome any questions you all have, and uh, go right ahead. You know, I, well, I guess I should use this. Um, I, I don't know that that in and of it, I wouldn't characterize that just as a bum rap. I, I think ultimately it is fraught with, with inaccuracy. But I, I would say that not just in Baltimore um, is that rap often given to certain owners, but around the country, especially in small and mid-market baseball communities, 
I think the public, to a great extent, is a victim of some poor reporting. A lot of the articles that are written about the business of sports, um, those types of questions about payroll and capability of, uh, of an owner or a team to, to, to keep a payroll at a competitive level, are written by um, journalists who uh, probably their best um, skill set is covering the games, talking about what happened in the game. They do a great job of that. But when you change your focus from talking about what went on on the field to what's going on in the finances of a team or how a league works in terms of its macroeconomics or how different leagues work, that's a whole nother project entirely. And I think a lot of the writers make the mistake of offering up very simplistic and largely flawed analyses of why teams do what they do. For instance, the NFL has a completely different model than the Major League Baseball. And, and, and as someone who's involved in baseball and not in the NFL, I will say that I applaud the NFL. I think it's a wonderful model. I think it is a model that has a tremendous number of parity mechanisms and creates competitive balance that's absolutely fantastic. And what's fantastic about it is fans in, in markets like Kansas City, uh, Pittsburgh, San Diego, et cetera, feel like they have an absolute unequivocal opportunity with no built-in disadvantages to compete with the big market clubs in Chicago, New York, and New England. And they feel that way, and they're right about that. Baseball has not achieved that yet. Baseball has situations where a New York team can outspend a team in Kansas City by a billion dollars in a 10-year period. Now that's a staggering inequality. That cannot be addressed by the owner of the Kansas City Royals turning away from his baseball business to one of his other businesses or his personal finances and putting money into the payroll. And, and to use the Kansas City example, the owner is David Glass, and certainly if he wanted to, he could. He could certainly turn to his family's personal fortune and start supplementing the, Roy supplementing, excuse me, the Royals' payroll. But if he did that, he would make the Royals to some degree more competitive. But he would have done nothing to solve the global problem that baseball has. The global issue of why you have haves, have-nots, and teams in the middle needs to be addressed globally. It's a league cause problem that needs to be addressed at the league level. Just as the NFL has been able to very elegantly address their problem, the NFL has taken the approach, we're going to have 32 teams. We're going to have teams in markets like, of all places, Green Bay, Wisconsin, uh, Jacksonville, Florida. If you want to have 32 clubs and you want to have markets of, of that size, which allow you to have 32 franchises, you cannot, you must have pa parity mechanisms that allow those teams to compete. You can't just let those teams be steamrolled by the Giants and the Jets and the Bears and so forth. And the NFL prohibits that. If the NFL had baseball's rules, then Peyton Manning would have played for the Colts for about two years and would have become the quarterback of the Jets and you could see that repeated. Aaron Rodgers wouldn't be the quarterback of the uh, Packers for very long. So I think that's where baseball needs to go. Until baseball does get there, there will be articles written about how this owner or that owner isn't spending enough. But the reality is, to make teams competitive, you have to remove the systemic uh, errors in the system. You need to make create parity mechanisms. Now, as to our team, and my father is an owner, the specific, the specific thing that's written periodically or charged is level. We, we have signed a, a decent number of our players. We, we obviously signed Brian Roberts a, 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 to a number of long-term contracts. And Brian was a very good player and unfortunately encountered a number of very uh, uh, improbable and unfortunate <coughs> injuries that limited what was otherwise a fantastic career. We signed Nick Markakis to a long contract and we just signed Adam Jones to uh, a, a very long contract in it for a, a large dollar amount. Um, almost invariably, as I look back over the last 20 years, I, I have yet to meet a, a, an Oriole player, or yet to remember, recall an example where an Oriole player was up to be renewed, was approaching free agency, that the writers, generally speaking, did not encourage us to re-sign. Rarely do they meet a player that they don't want you to re-sign. If we re-sign them all, um, We'll probably have a team of names we can put up on a marquee, but not a team that's very competitive at the end of the day. The, the Buck Walter, Dan Duquette approach, and really to a large extent the Andy McPhail approach as well, 
was not let's sign everybody because everybody's up for renewal, but let's sign appropriately. Let's sign the, the, the Roberts, the Marcakis, and the Jones type players. The reason you sign players like that is not only because they're good on the field, and we talked about this a moment ago, but because they're good people, they have good makeups. Uh, they're charitably oriented as well as being athletically gifted. So it's a balance, and a big part of that is chemistry. The team that has been very successful or competitive the last two years, winning 89 or 90 games the last two years, a big part of that is their physical gifts, but an even bigger part of that in some ways is their chemistry and their makeup as people. It's a very, uh, I'll say, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, conservative, clean living, good group of guys. Uh, Brady Anderson is one of our VPs under Dan Duquette made the comment that he played 20 years and his, in his entire major league career being around all different groups of guys, and including his college years, by the way, at UC Irvine, he had never encountered a group of players that had a better bunch of guys and a better team chemistry of really liking one another and getting along than the teams that we've had the last two years. So if putting together winning teams were simply about money and simply about signing everybody and anybody, to the extent that when an owner doesn't sign someone he's to some extent criticized or even pillory, then that would be a very simplistic notion of how to do things. I do think the owners have to put significant resources up and you've got to have a competitive payroll, there's no question. But the, the, the individual franchise owners are going to need some help at the league level to correct this, this uh, systemic inequality and move the, the league more towards the NFL model. And then I think everybody in these small and mid-markets, fans, supporters, and media are going to be a whole lot happier overall. I don't know if that was too long-winded of an answer, but that's... Do I see that? Well, I think, I think the commissioner has done a great job over the last five or ten years at attempting to insert as many parity mechanisms as he could. Um, and the commissioner's done a fantastic job in growing the revenues of baseball. In the 70s, the revenues of baseball were a billion dollars. Today, they're over eight billion dollars. So you can't argue with the popularity of the sport. Um, baseball sells 80 million tickets almost. So I think it was 74, 75 last year. It has been between 75 and 80 the last five or six years. And minor league baseball sells 40 million tickets. That's 120 million tickets. And you can compare that to uh, three other great leagues, but the NFL, the NHL, and the NBA combined sell 50, 55 million tickets. Now, many more games in baseball, obviously, but baseball is an incredibly popular spectator sport. Commissioner's done a great job of that. He's added playoff spots. The, the, the adding of playoff spots is, obvious, is quite obviously a mechanism to try and get small and mid-market teams more of an opportunity to get in the postseason. But it to some degree recognizes the difficulty small and mid-market teams have in competing during the regular season. Because if you look at, the, let's, let's take the last 10 years, or take a 10-year period, 95 to 2005, as, as an example. I, I say that period because I studied it and I can this moment recall the numbers, but uh, during that 10-year period, the Yankees won 93 games a, a, a season for 10 years. The Red Sox won 92, and the Oakland A's won 91. The Yankees' cost per win was $1.5 million. The Red Sox cost per win was $1.3 million, and the Oakland A's under Billy Bean's cost per win was $500,000. Now we know the teams that won the most games and won the most playoff appearances and the most championships, that would be the Yankees and the Red Sox. But I think you can look at those numbers and say that the Oakland A's were the most accomplished franchise. If they gave a franchise award out, they did the best job. Well, when that happens, when the best performing team on merit didn't win the most championships, spent a whole lot less money and did better, that's an argument to level the playing field bring down the payrolls of the big teams, bring up the payrolls of the small teams and have caps and floors and full revenue sharing, which is what the NFL has. So I think the commissioners and the, and the union are headed in that direction. How long it'll be before they fully go that way, I, don't, I can't predict. I can say I don't expect the NFL owners any time to move in the direction of the baseball rules because it's been eminently successful for the league. Um, until then, more playoff appearances, more wild cards will have to do. 
slotting uh, limitations on what teams could spend on draft picks? Was it was an effort to prevent the Yankees and other big markets, now the Dodgers with the new ownership are, are spending a lot of money, to prevent those teams from, in addition to cornering the market on major league talent, going into places like the Dominican Republic and others, and domestically, and buying up all the best players. So it's definitely headed there in, uh, in, in fits and starts, and the commissioner has been as aggressive as you can be, done a wonderful job, but there's, there's more ground to cover. Yes, I think they can. Um, it would take some phase ends, and it would take you know some sort of a transitional period. But of course, they can. The 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 process that a league, any league, uh, whether it's the NFL, MLB, or any league you might name anywhere, goes through is they they say, okay, well, what are our global revenues? Uh, and then, of course, the first step is to make a collective bargaining agreement with the union membership as how you're going to split those, those, those uh, revenues. Interestingly, the, the, the relative splits between when you look at the NFL or the ML, MLB or other leagues are, are relatively comparable. 50%, um, 48 49 a point here and there. So that's not really an issue, league to league. The players are going to get what, what they're entitled to. The next question then becomes, well, what are the rules going to be? about how the revenues are shared and how one is gonna have parity. Once the membership of, the, of, the, of a union knows that they're gonna get a defined benefit, a defined uh, aggregate payroll among the franchises, then really the issue is what's the best way to uh, manage how those franchises are able to spend to make sure you don't have basically a crooked diagonal line with a team like the Yankees at 225 million and a team like the Marlins or the Astros at 25 or 35 million. That's obviously untenable and largely in an unfair to the communities, I think, in some cases that invest in these franchises. Not, and by that, I don't mean the owners. I mean the uh, taxpayers who invest in facilities, the fans that follow the games, and, and also the, the players. Uh, when a player's drafted number one in the first round by the Yankees, versus drafted by the Royals, uh, and I'm not picking on the Royals, they're strictly an example. Um, obviously those players really, at least for their six years that they're under control before they become eligible for free agency, are arguably not created equal. Um, if you're the number one pitcher coming out of high school and I'm the number one hitter this year, it's pretty clear that if you get taken by the Royals, you're probably not in as good of a position to succeed as I am if I get taken by the Yankees. So there's inequity all around the landscape. The league can enter into collective bargaining agreements, and the union can too, that divide up the revenues and then impose work rules that create parity. And people talk about caps, and caps come with floors. Because if you don't, if you, it's not just a matter of bringing down the Yankees from 200 plus million to say 125 or 30 million. You then have to bring up the Marlins and the Astros to that same area, 100, 130 million, because if only in doing that do you then get 30 clubs spending the aggregate amount of money that the union's membership is, has bargained for. But absolutely you can do it. There's nothing special about the sport of baseball that prohibits it relative to the sport of football that uh, uh, allows it to happen. Yes? Well, you commented on the value of parity, revenue, as the main barriers, because it's just it's such good common sense <coughs> to have uh, revenue sharing. Um, I think uh, I can't speak for what's in the minds of 29 other clubs. I can really only speak for this one. But I, I think that teams become accustomed to doing business in, in certain ways. Teams build their business plans, their branding, their marketing around certain assumptions and certain uh, principles, messages. 
uh, marketing the Yankees in New York City takes on a certain quality of its own. And what it, it has taken on, if, if you were running the Yankees tomorrow, or if I were, I would most likely be uh, uh, urged or um, tempted to manage that club and its branding in a certain way. And that way would probably revolve around communicating to my fans, our Yankee fans, that we're gonna win. That we're gonna win 90 plus games. It's almost like uh, the analogy of signing your name to the SATs, you get 200 points or whatever that old example is. You know, marketing the Yankees is different than marketing the Padres because you sell winning. Other teams sell competitiveness, um, the family atmosphere at the ballpark, the affordability, the fact that baseball tickets are incredibly accessible to people of all income levels. So if you spend 20 years owning the Padres, you become accustomed to doing business in a Padres way. When you become, you spend 20 years running the uh, Yankees or the uh, Red Sox or the Dodgers, all good people, but they're accustomed to marketing their sport is, we're gonna win, we're, we're gonna win the world championship every year. They're in a very refined category of two, three, four, five, and I don't think they, those teams know another way. Just like some teams understand that the way you build teams is you erect a backdrop and you turn on the cameras and you hold, hand a jersey and a large amount of money to a player that up until that moment played for someone else. Uh, other teams uh, like Oakland, the uh, Montreal old where Dan Duquette was a general manager, had to do business a different way. They couldn't sign anybody else's players because of the nature of the system. So they made it their business to scout and develop better than everybody else. So I think it's just the Yankees and other teams coming around to the idea that they can be successful under a different model. Just like the New York Giants and the New York Jets have been able to be successful. Well, particularly the Giants, obviously, have been an incredibly successful team in the biggest market in the United States, operating under a salary cap. So running the Giants and running the J Yankees is a very different thing, even though they're in the same city. And I guess I don't know that some of these clubs are ready to make that switch. Um, but ultimately, it's, it's going to be depending on the leadership of the commissioner's office and a vote of the, of the teams in trying to make these transitions. Uh, I just think it, it would be an eminently better game for the entire body of fans throughout the country. That It shouldn't be that, in my opinion, 10 or 12 or 15 million of that 80 million fans um, always expect to win or at least to be in the hunt, and then the bottom 15 or 20 million feel like, they're really up against it, and they really don't have much of a choice, and spring training's the most exciting time of the year. Um, but I, I think until um, that dialogue continues, and those teams realize that there's a way to transition into this different NFL-type model, you'll have status quo. And by the way, it won't make, I don't believe it makes the Yankees or the Red Sox any less uh, valuable as assets, or any less uh, 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 attractive as cash flow vehicles. Arguably, they're gonna make more money under that system. They just won't win as much. Personnel, you know, the team has has done remarkably well over the last two years, um, given uh, the payroll limitation and the discrepancy. They competed very well with teams that have spent a lot more money than they have. And the difference, I guess, listening to Dan and Bob talk in particular, and, and I, over the last two seasons, is obviously in 2012 we got tremendous performances uh, from Jason Hamill and Wee and Chen. And both uh, Jason Hamill had largely a, a, an injury plague season last year, and we and Jen spent some time on the disabled list. And our team is very much built around, notwithstanding the incredible offensive performances of the particular Chris Davis and other Manny Machado and others, um, it, the philosophy of the team that Dan and Buck have built is heavily dependent on the performance of pitching, in particular starting pitching. Your, your starting pitchers pitch 60 or 70 percent of the innings you're going to pitch, and as we know, uh, even as casual fans, baseball uh, is driven 60 or 70 percent by the pitching performance. You, it makes up for a lot of ills on the offensive side. So I think that difference, those two starters having pretty good years the year before, and then 
a little bit less effective through no fault of their own in 2013, probably made the difference between winning you know, 88, 89 games and winning 93, 94, 95. And that's why I think Dan and Buck had made it a, a priority to uh, improve the starting pitching, which obviously is, that hasn't happened yet, but there are still some pitchers out there that we're interested in talking to, and they're doing everything that they can. Um, I, I think, um, obviously there's some questions about closer um, and the bullpen as a whole, and they're still attempting to bolster that. I think if anything, you're gonna see Dan and Buck try to improve the pitching before they improve anything else, and that's still our priority. We're still, and I think Dan was quoted saying that we had money to spend and we were intending to spend it, in particular to bolster the pitching. If the pitching performs as well or better than it did in the last two years, then I would say in my amateur opinion and handicapping that the team will be competitive, um, maybe better than competitive. If the pitching falters, then you know we'll, we'll, it, it would be hard to imagine a scenario where we would do as well. Um, you know, I think that, I think you just gotta, they, they've, they've stressed, uh, Dan Duquette and Buck Showalter that is, have stressed staying true to the, the philosophy, um, not chasing too many high-priced offensive players who are flavor of the moment free agents. When the right one, you know, because the other issue is, if you chase everybody else's players, you, you may not have, you're, you need to have the money to re-sign your players. You want to sign the Chris Davises, you want to sign the Manny Machados. And I think your fans want you to do that too. So there's always a balance there, but you've got to have the pitching, and I think we'll rise and fall, you know, based on that pitching. The nice thing is, this is a young team. So if it were a team with an average age of 34, every year that goes by, there are more questions about the team's ability to perform. But when it's a team of this age bracket, times actually helps you. These players have all gotten more seasoned, more experienced. Experience is incredibly important in all sports, but particularly in baseball, where there's that game within the game. There's the mental process that go, has gone, goes through, particularly between pitcher or pitching staff and catcher. Um, the offensive players, obviously, every game they play is a better thing for their ability to uh, compete. So I think we're around where we were, and hopefully some of the starters step up. Chris Tillman has been fantastic from the all-star break of 2012 right through all of 2013. I mean, if you look at his statistics over the last year and a half, um, just about everybody in the league would like to get him. So you want to keep players like that. And um, I, you know, I think they're bullish on the team. They're not saying uh, we're standing pat. They're not saying we're just going to ride these guys and not add to it. I think we've just been looking for the right combination. Um, everybody wants a starter, whether you're offering up a, a five-year, $75 million deal or a two-year, $25 million deal are obviously very different things. They, Dan and Buck, want to, have very much wanted to preserve flexibility so that we'll have the resources to keep the guys who we already have and really, really like. Um, that's as close as I can get to a prognostication. <laughs> sure. Uh, can you give us an update on Dylan Bundy's status and do you expect that he had any impact this coming season? Uh, I actually can. I cannot give you a reliable <laughs> medical sort of progress report because I haven't heard one in a while. Um, I think it's too early to tell what the pitcher with that injury what it would it would be sort of setting him up for potential kind of uh, I, I can't predict what what he's going to do but 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 we feel really good about him I mean he's a, he's a player with all the potential and all the promise and everybody feels as good about him today as they did as they did the day we drafted him so and that's unusual in a, in a baseball draft that's 90 percent ineffective to get a guy from draft day to any day and feel as bullish about him is is wonderful Notwithstanding the injury problem, the players come back from these injuries and sometimes come back better. So um, that's encouraging. But other than that, I really couldn't say specifically. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the first part. Well, in the, it, uh, when you're talking about a younger, a young player, a player is in his first three years of service time. Uh, essentially, the club in the first three years, as you, as you may know, has the ability to pay the player a 
essentially what it chooses within the confines that obviously has to be paid at least the major league minimum. So if you have an injured player of that service time, you can really take a year, year or wait and see kind of an approach. You're really not obligated to any large outlay. Once the player becomes an arbitration eligible player, which would take place in their fourth, fifth, and sixth seasons, that obviously is a different situation because you're required to either reach a mutually agreeable salary number with the, between team and player or file for arbitration. And in arbitration, the criteria are very specific, uh, finely narrowed criteria where you can only compare players to, uh, in terms of comparables, which would be like uh, housing comparables, you can only compare players to other players in their service time. So inevitably, player salaries, that's why you see this incredible increases in player salaries as soon as they become arbitration eligible. It's sort of the, in, the give and take with the union. The, the, the team has the best of it in the first three years. The players start to have the better of it in the middle, next three years, and then obviously free agency starts in year six, after year six, absent some long-term contract. And then the players are able to go out and get whatever they can command. So if it's a zero to three player, you can strictly take a wait and see and see if the player comes back and rehabilitates. If it's an arbitration eligible player, possibly not, uh, you'll have to consider whether you want to tender the player for arbitration based on his past performance, knowing he may not be able to perform physically or not. And you, you could say, listen to the player, I'm not going to tender you, but I'd like to make a deal with you. I don't want to go to arbitration, but I want to keep you. I don't want to non-tender you. So there's some options there. When you're talking about a veteran player as a free agent, there are a couple things you can do. One, principally, uh, you can establish um, performance bonuses. You could say to a player, well, I know you've had some injury problems. I'm going to bring you in as a starting pitcher. I'm going to give you a $2 million base. And then if you start 10 games or 20 games or 30 games, you'll get incentive salary of you know X million, Y million, Z million. And in that way, you can commit to a player the potential to make, say, six or eight or nine million dollars, but you're really only guaranteeing them a small amount up front in the event he can't perform. The other thing you can do is you can assign players and take uh, disability insurance out on them, um, where um, you're basically insuring them uh, contingent upon certain agreed upon deductibles, which, which kick in after, if in fact they ultimately become injured, um, depending on the number of days they sit out, uh, the team potentially would receive uh, insurance proceeds offsetting the salary you commit to them. But that is a case-by-case -case analysis. It depends on the particular player's injury reviewed by you know, uh, doctors and insurance people and so forth. So that's another mechanism where you can hedge. But in the, in the younger player, Dylan Bundy's example, I think everybody's just waiting and seeing and wishing the best in terms of a, a, a quick and effective 